Great. Welcome to um, today's lectures. We've got Molly um, talking about architecture and virtual reality. You see, and then we've got Justin talking about well, human rights, really, I guess. Um, so without further ado, over to you. So how do you respond to our virtual reality? Architecture and urban planning is something that affects every single one of us. We live, work, and sleep in buildings that have been designed by architects. We move from place to place in cities and towns and can carefully plan by designers. Each building and street has been devised and constructed to fully cater to our needs. However, some environments created are far more successful than others, both aesthetically and practically. I'm sure in some buildings and some rooms and spaces can automatically feel more at ease more productive and more comfortable. And this is because architecture can really affect how we feel and work beyond what we might expect. Some of the most obvious factors that come to mind are open space, nature, good facilities, quiet roads, and software infrastructure, all of which can positively influence our lives and health. But how great an impact does architecture really have on us? Studies have shown People living in residential zones that lack greenery are twice as likely to develop psychiatric diseases. People living and working in cities are more likely to develop schizophrenia as well as chronic anxiety or depression. Of course, this is impacted by the lifestyle surrounding the society and urban environment. So it is therefore pivotal for architects to make the world as stress free and positive as possible. If we go back in history, when cities and urban areas were first being designed, information resources were very limited and there's far less of an understanding about how spaces should be designed. Naturally, zones for working were grouped together. The same goes for living and entertainment. As this is what made the most sense. Essentially, the same goes for scale. However, with the digitalization of the world, so much more information has become available to architects about how we should be living. Some of the data we are now able to collect comes from heart rate monitors and EEG headsets, both showing us where people are most stimulated by the environment. Social media shows us where people are likely to take photographs and share them with others. Trackers are showing us how people move around the city and where they choose to go in areas of a similar function. Something less technical, which also tells designers a lot, are desire lines. These are routes taken instead of pavements, such as over grass. Over grass. It gives a literal representation of how people want to move around the city, outside what has been set up for them. Using these big data analytics, architects are able to uncover certain patterns and nuances of human psychology, which has become a very powerful tool in transforming the built environment around us. However, even though we have all of this new data guiding designers, there is still an unmistakable disconnect in the design process to the final result. Because no matter how many drafts are drawn up, how much is spent on the project, how much data is collected. No one truly knows how a building will end up looking, let alone how people will respond to it once it has been completed. By the time a building is finished, the city is finished, it is too late to alter due to many obvious reasons such as budget and resources. So, if architecture can affect us so extensively, why are we taking such a gamble in the design process? And it's because of this disconnect that the industry has moved into virtual reality. Architects have been using model making software for some time now, making them able to create accurate and detailed renditions of the building before they are actually built. But no matter how many angles we get or how exact the measurements are, we still can't truly really understand how people will react to the environment until they're fully immersed. However, in reality, we can create an environment that's realistic and time controlled. And let go of real world restraints and take advantage of infinitely flexible possibilities, contextualize whole complex ecosystems, and to make a completely immersive space. VR is an instrument for spatial understanding and creation rather than a representational tool. Thanks, The kind of virtual reality architects are beginning to use is supposed to give us an opportunity for full immersion within a space, not only visually, but also be tapping into all of our other senses. In order to create a holistic environment that bears a strong similarity to reality, we need to make the space feel interactive, and scent and sound, good airflow, correct lighting, have movement throughout, such as rustling leaves or human avatars, which make the place feel less stagnant 
the therefore more realistic. The experience has to exist both in reality and in simulation. To do this, the program must have modes and triggers which change the environment, something that some its own stages but develops in rapidly. This is called the immersive virtual environment, or IV. Overall, what we have found is that the ambiance and behavioural realism hold greater importance than any visual qualities or virtual realism. This technology has now reached a point that is regarded as a valid experimentation media. So far, IVs have been used to hold a number of experiments which test and monitor the human response. The cubicle was an IV based experiment conducted to produce a high level of user engagement and induce strong emotions. Essentially, the pair was immersed in the locker's cubicle, given a mundane climbing task to complete. But over time, the basic nature of their surroundings began to warp and change, only subtly at first, but increasing over time. The results showed that the majority of people showed great fluctuations of productivity, productivity and mood, before eventually becoming very uneasy and distressed by the end, within the uncanny environment. Next slide, please. Similar types of experiments showed a variety of different results. The typical conclusion shows how it sensed the immersion three years within IVs. Commonly, people show very visceral reactions to the environment, whether they make noise, jump changes, or even go as far as to try and use their phones to help them through the task. And this is where virtual realities and IVs become really important to architecture. If we can design a room, a building, or even a full city, and then translate it across to virtual reality and make an immersive virtual environment, we will be able to test the human response to a building and its impact on us before anything even physically exists. And this is because we will have already experienced the environment through the IV. Next slide, please. The built world we live in will soon be designed not only to be aesthetically pleasing, but also to benefit our health, mindset and social patterns, ultimately positively influencing and changing how we live. Although this technology may seem complex and somewhat futuristic, it is actually very accessible and we already are very familiar with this kind of technology. And this is because they are quite similar to video games. For example, the World Institute of British Architects work with a company called Blockworks, who use Minecraft to create full urban environments and design buildings to test or they actually exist. Essentially, games such as these have significantly trained millions of players in computer trade design, making immersive reality very accessible with great prospects for the future. Overall, virtual reality and immersive virtual environments, whether in the most basic forms or within the most complex software, is transforming the architectural industry as we know, as well as many others such as medicine and politics making it what many consider to have the potential to be a revolutionary as a computer resource. Still taking it. Well, it's taking it. I'm curious, there's a link from the fantastic one. Thank you very much indeed. Think about the, the school. The school is a classic example of the sort of environment that's just adapted and evolved over time. So, you know, those uh, holidays used to be where Clifton is now, and then when we brought the girls around our schools, it's a big school. Which, which bits, I mean, think about the sort of you know, how people use space and how space is expected. Which bits around the school do you think work really well from sort of how people live inside our place? And which bits do you think really good and brilliant? Well, I guess our school has so much history. So, there's always been created to how people want it at the time. So something like the Queen's building or the main the main building, it's you know old fashioned, it doesn't necessarily have everything which we might want it to and the technology we might we should did have, but we still make it accessible for us and what we need. But for example with the new Pascal building we now know that we need some spaces and um, small rooms um, to hold different sizes apart from the past we have. So I think as we go through the school, we can really see how um, what we need has changed within the school. Okay. So any bit that you've just demolished completely. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
how's your chance? <laughs> 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 I'll let you keep the interior symbol exactly as it is and change the extra symbol. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, in your research, do you find any other industries that get benefited from virtual reality? Yeah, so um, something that I found was in the medical field, um, immersive reality is being used for um, conditions such as Parkinson's disease. So essentially, if they can put someone with a disease such as this into immersive reality, they can begin to improve their control, um, you know, physically, and get used to a, a very controlled and safe environment before they actually go into a potentially harmful situation. Um, another thing that came up was there was this company that I've been talking about called Blockworks. They created a big Minecraft library essentially that had been designed to look like a library in the neoclassical style. Um, however, they created books inside, which um, as books that have been restricted in certain areas of the world, maybe due to like, religious beliefs. So it's a kind of a loophole almost to uh, reach certain places where things have been available before. Right. So I think it's something that we want to see in what's next. Do you think it should be more focused on kind of how actually it can make us feel in situations like hospitals and medical states and kind of um, psychiatric units or places that can affect us on this? Yeah, um, I think when we're designing something, we definitely need to look beyond the practicalities. So, you know, this is summed up. We need to make it something which actually works and people to see a good mindset. Um, it's all very kind of sci fi, this. It feels to me, I sort of various films are springing into mind in terms of sort of utopian futures or dystopian futures. Um, I guess my question is is there a danger with this um, that you end up ultimately with quite generic designs? You know, will the same things always appeal? Will it not depend on which people you use to test the virtual reality? You know, it could, could you know, there's, there's, there's wonderful things, aren't there, about, about buildings that don't work sometimes, that we then adapt to them, but sometimes they look more beautiful. Could we end up with some kind of generic way of planning a city, generic architecture that has a formula that always works? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, if you are going for certain formulas, things are going to turn out in a similar way, but um, architecture is obviously, it's a practical thing, you know, some, something you live in, something you work in, it's also a form of art, so I don't think one will ever become more efficient than the other, um, I think it will be considered that we will try and make spaces as good and positive as possible, but at the same time not lose the artistic element to it. It's not really a question. Have you come across the app you know, Google Arts and Culture? Uh, no. I don't know. Either. It's fascinating. You can do all sorts of things. So, for example, you can you sort of scan, scan the new ring um, and then decide which art gallery you want to go visit. And it will effectively then see it through the screen on it. But effectively, you can then have a walkthrough of that particular art gallery in whatever space you happen to be in. There's a walk up to various paintings and tap on them and get some information about them. Like so, yeah, so the, the Google Lens, which I'm a massive fan of. Well, you haven't come across that one yet. Well, Sophie. Well, thank you very much, Molly. I never really think of when I'm going down the street about like someone actually thought about this building, like houses. I never think about people actually designing them. And it was really insightful to hear about how much it can affect our mental health and all of that. And um, also virtual reality, I never realized how much thought had gone into the design of everything and that you could completely look at something before it's even been built. It's not really interesting. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Ah, success. Right. We need to make this big, don't we? Okay. Never used canvas before. And it shows. It's a presentation. It's not like it. I don't know why. I'm sure we can still flick through it. I'd just kind of like to get it big. Just see what I mean? It's not like maybe it doesn't like sharing. I can still flick through them. Sound like a sorry. Um, it's this computer so on it might lose it together, right. Justin, I think. I think we'll have to deal with it. I think we can be just honestly, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> too advanced. Yes, that will work. So right, okay. Not quite on the screen, but we're presenting. Okay, Justin, you go. So uh, I think I should start by attacking the title of this lecture, which is uh, partly inspired by the work of Ron Dawkins, who's one of the greatest legal philosophers in America. So in one of his, his books, he describes us all to be subject to the Lord's Empire, with, with its territory expanding not, into, um, not only to the domain of philosophy of law, but also to that of politics, uh, sociology, and sometimes to economics and culture and so on. And in modern days, one of the most prominent ways the laws expand to that part is through the field of human rights. And I'm here today to challenge whether the law has gone too far. So it may sound a bit like what the Daily Mail would say, but bear with me. So next slide, please. <laughs> so I guess we have to ask ourselves, well, what are our human rights? They are first and foremost sets of entitlements that we all share by virtue of being, well, human beings. So they're not privileges or gifts that can be granted or revoked by the state. They are universal. We, all, we are all equally entitled to them, inalienable. They can't be taken away from us. And they are indivisible, interdependent, and interrelated. So one set of rights can never be enjoyed fully without the other being realized as well. So a state cannot just say that, well, we fulfill the economic and social rights of our people, so we can ignore civil political rights. You can't have that. Concept of human rights demands that all rights needs to be implemented at the same time, but that would obviously be dependent on the actual situation of each country. Next slide, please. So why do human rights cause so much controversies? I don't mean just by developing countries, but also uh, well, more advanced countries like the UK and the US. One of the issues that I think is important is, well, where do human rights come from? They're not fossils that can be discovered by archaeologists. So, well, in the old days, the answer was simple. God was the answer. God provides us with the gifts of human rights, and only God can take them away. Or you may believe in natural law. So human rights are things that are inherent in us, and we can work out for reason. Or in modern days, some uh, philosophers suggest that human rights are mere social constructs based on human experience. Of course, we know by, for example, that if the state does not uphold basic human rights, the well, entire society might disintegrate into chaos and or civil unrest. So that's one of the issues that I identified. Next slide, please. And the second issue here is, well, 
what should we do when rights conflict with each other? There are mainly two categories of rights. There are absolute rights, like the right to life and the right from torture. And these are rights that, under no circumstances, can they be uh, justifiably restricted. There are rights, the majority of rights are political rights. So, a right to protest, for example, they can be limited for some legitimate reasons by the state. So, because of the pandemic, our uh, freedom to uh, peaceful assembly has been affected. Or, when I, when, if I say something that incites hatred, my freedom of speech might be limited for the protection of others. But how to best balance uh, construct by someone? Should my freedom of movement be restricted for, for the protection of health? Next slide, please. Who decides? Are human rights inherent in humanity? Has the government gone too far in restricting our fundamental freedom and human and rights to protect the health of others? And the answer, of course, is next slide, please. <laughs> Us. At the end of the day, we have to make decisions for ourselves. God might not look like our decisions, but ultimately, at the end of the day, we have to hold responsible for our own decisions. Next slide, please. So what's the purpose of us having governments such that they can make collective decisions on behalf of us? So as we probably know, typically there are three branches of governments in all countries. There is the legislature, which uh, represents the people, and they enact laws which uh, after some deliberations. And there's the executive, which implements the law by necessary means. And there is, of course, the judiciary, the courts, the judges, who acts as an umpire between parties when a legal dispute arises. And they, do, they resolve these disputes by checking the law. So these are the three pillars together which underpin our way of life. And this is an important concept that I'll go back later. So in a lot of human rights debates, the courts usually stand out uh, amongst the three branches of governments. And partly that's, that's to do with the fact that we see courts as the last bastion to defend our human rights. And one of the ways that courts do that is through the process of what we call judicial review. So that's when uh, the courts uh, review the lawfulness of how a process has been made by a government authority. And if it's found to be unlawful, contravening the law, then should the decision can be quashed or not quashed. So in our country, because of parliamentary sovereignty, our Supreme Court cannot just say that, oh, because it's contravening the law, you can just undo Parliament's law. But whereas in the US, where the doctrine of separation of powers is more developed and more mature, the US Supreme Court can strike down laws which contravenes uh, the US Constitution. So as in the well-known case of Brown versus Board of uh, Education in 1954, the courts held that it was unconstitutional for schools to impose race, racial segregation in public schools. Next slide, please. So what's there to challenge? If human rights are, well, they are stated in the law and they are universal, then surely the courts to enforce them should not be challenged. It's a matter of facts. And next slide, please. And there is not much to challenge, indeed. There are some controversial cases that I think deserves us to have a greater uh, look at. So, in the case of Roe vs. Wade in 1973, the US Supreme Court struck down state law, state law which prohibits abortion. And more recently, the case of the Burgerfell vs. Hodges, say it uh, was held by the court that. Must, that they must recognize and license same sex marriage. Now, in the UK, whilst our Supreme Court is not as powerful as the US one, we're still bound by the European Convention of Human Rights. And in 2005, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg held that it was unlawful for the UK to impose uniform bans on prisoners to vote. Now, these are undoubtedly highly contentious moral and social issues. So another problem arises. Next slide, please. Are our judges equipped in uh, providing a solution to these highly disputed issue? Some may say that, well, yes, the judiciary is, uh, is independent and it's impartial in applying the law. But that doesn't answer whether it's competent. 
one of the uh, weaknesses of our course here in the UK and in the US is that its social representation is highly limited. In the UK, so far, uh, currently, there are only two female justices serving, with no uh, justices coming from a ethnic minority background. Whereas in the US, slightly better, there are three female justices currently serving, with only two coming from a ethnic minority background. The limited social representation has an impact on how justices apply the law. Because, well, what the reason is, well, sometimes judges suffer like us, conscious or unconscious bodies. And that affects how judges view different cases. And of course, by narrowing their life experiences, that affects how a judge may view uh, backgrounds of the case. And ultimately, this will undermine trust from, public, from the public if somehow judges are viewed as beings from the other tenants. And this, another aspect is that, well, different justices have different judicial philosophy as to how a statute can be interpreted. Some of them look at the legislative intention, how the justices intended the, uh, the statute to work. Some of them took a more purposive approach. So what the law should say in a more modern context, given its purpose. But that, in a more uh, public, so when in the US, for example, when the court is so powerful and when the uh, justices are selected in a more public way than the UK, we see that like people don't really care about their judicial or professional policies. The question is no longer how just justices decide cases, but what is the outcome of the case? And this will lead to perceived bias, which ultimately undermines the impartiality uh, of the courts, uh, how it's perceived anyways. Next slide, please. So if we use abortion as an example, I take abortion as an example because it concerns what's the most fundamental right, uh, human rights, the right to life. It's irreducible. Yet it's one of the most profound moral arguments that has ever existed. If one was to assert the right to life, then it begs two questions. Should an unborn child be considered as a person legally? Is it not murder for a doctor to determine the life of fetus, but the potential to reason and conscience that, and to have conscience? If the one still asserts the right to privacy, well, is abortion within a mother's autonomy? Should, uh, should the health of the mother be considered? What is the correct answer to these highly contentious moral questions? Next slide, please. Around the same period, UK faced the same ethical conundrum. But rather than resorting to the courts, the, Parliament, uh, the UK Parliament took it to its own hand by enacting the Abortion Act in 1967 after some extensive debates. I think this, the different approaches by the UK and the US shows how we make law really matters as has been shown in 2019, where abortion in the UK is less contentious, whereas in the US, it remains a highly disputed issue, and it's one of the major focus when people are selecting for a new justice, new justice, as can be demonstrated last year following the death of uh, Justice Ginsburg. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing that courts cannot do is that it does not provide a platform for discussions. In courts, the answer is yes or no. Is it lawful or is it lawful? But in reality, we have a spectrum of opinions in ethical uh, dilemmas such as abortion. One person may say that the right to life should never be undermined. Another person may say, well, the uh, privacy of the mother and the health of her matters too. And some, I think the majority of us uh, share opinions somewhere between the two opposites. Uh, next slide, please. So why do we need to put these things into discussion? Well, for natural law theorists, 
there's only a correct answer for each question. But different people have different interpretations. We all like the blind man by touching part of the elephant, thinking that we know uh, what the elephant looks like, but actually we only know parts of it. And what politics does is that it offers a platform for people to discuss, to debate issues, to engage with each other, and find a solution uh, which allows compromises, which costs can never offer. Next slide, please. So, in conclusion, human rights are, as the European, uh, sorry, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, provides a common standard uh, for all human beings to uphold human dignity and to maximize our autonomy. And rightly, we should value this set of uh, ideas. But courts cannot provide the answer to every single question in life by interpreting human rights. We have to engage with each other to find an answer. And this is how we can ultimately uh, live in harmony in society. And that is what the law is here for. Thank you very much. <laughs>